Welcome to part 6 of a series of videos describing how to perform chip seek analysis using Galaxy. In this part I'm going to add some more flesh to the bones of the MAX2 peak caller results. In part 5 I showed you how you can find location preferences of binding regions to nearby genes using CEAS. For example, highlighting a propensity for binding within the promoter region of genes. I also shamelessly plugged our own tool, RNA Chip Integrator, that can be used to annotate the MAX2 results with the closest gene or genes to each binding region. I'm going to describe one of the many ways of running a motif discovery analysis. The main aim of this type of analysis is to identify a short sequence, also called a motif, of about 6 to 10 nucleotides, to which the protein of interest is binding. Therefore, motif discovery is applicable to DNA binding proteins, such as transcription factors. Epigenetic signals, such as histone marks, may be associated with sequences with certain characteristics, but not a specific motif, or at least not one that I know of. Prior to ChIP-seq experiment, uh, the binding motif of a transcription factor may not be known, in which case the discovery of a novel motif is notable in itself. But even if the motif has been previously published, the experiment may have used a different tissue or cell type and the transcription factor may exhibit different binding preferences. Motif discovery can also discover the motifs of other transcription factors that bind close by and are required to work in tandem, or act as pioneers to modify the chromosome chromatin landscape for the protein to bind efficiently. There are plenty of, rev of review papers on the subject, but the PubMed ID I've included here links to a good all-round review. Part 5 of this series described the peak calling step of ChIP-seq analysis. MAX2 outputs the genomic coordinates of the binding regions where there is enrichment for the chip reads over and above the DNA input reads that represent the genomic background. Motif discovery programs generally take in DNA sequence directly, therefore some extra processing of the MAX2 results is required. Sequence is usually submitted as a FASTA file which contains two lines per sequence, the header and then the sequence itself. The sequence should not be too long, otherwise the results will become noisy, so typically 100 to 200 nucleotides is best. I generally obtain 200 bases of sequence centred upon the summit of each binding region. This is not immediately available from the peak calling analysis. I showed in part 5 of this series how to obtain this sequence using Galaxy. So my program of choice is called Weeder. I've been using it a long time. Uh, in 2014 it got updated to version 2 adding some improvements to make it simpler to use and with some better functionality. Weeder can be found at the Pervezi Labs website uh, here, uh, along with some other tools that are useful in um, downstream chip seek analysis. This includes PSCAN chip that can identify the over-representation of already known transcription factor motifs in the same sequences that we're going to input into motif discovery analysis. Um, so when we do version 2 was released I actually wrote a short summary or review 
on biostars.org. Uh, if you've not previously used this website, I can highly recommend it as it's a great place to ask and answer questions about bioinformatics. So if you've got any any problems with uh, analyses, for example, uh, you can go there. So there are different algorithms for motif discovery and WIDA falls into the motif enumeration category. The review I mentioned details some of the other options. Enumeration means that the occurrence of motifs in the input sequences are counted and in this case compared to a pre-calculated set of genome specific background motifs. This has the advantage of not requiring a background set of sequences. It was initially used to identify common motifs in defined promoter regions but has ev evolved to consider much larger numbers of input sequences as seen with ChIP-seq data. So we depicts all oligos or small sequences of length 6, 8 and 10 in the input sequences and collects for each all occurrences in the input with at most one, two or three substitutions uh, respectively. By default oligos are only collected from the first 100 sequences. Motifs are compared to the background expected values for each motif. Successful motifs are then scanned against the entire data set and a frequency matrix is generated. Positional weight matrices or PWMs are then cleaned or filtered using the expectation maximization or EM algorithm. There are of course other programs for motif discovery including MEME and peak motif. The URLs can be seen here. Our group has made a Galaxy tool that can be installed on any local instance of Galaxy and has been endorsed by the Pervasi lab on their own website. So now I'm going to show you how to run WIDA2 using our tool in Galaxy. Uh, the first piece of uh, information you need to supply is the sequence and if you watch part 5 you will have watched me uh, recreate the 200 base pair summit regions and extract the sequence for those. Um, so they're contained here in uh, item number 51 which we can just view here and it has the faster header and then 200 bases of sequence for each summit region. Um, so my reasoning for having 200 bases of sequence is that this allows for a small deviation between the predicted summit and the true binding site uh, in the genome. Uh, there is no need to mask for repetitive sequence as uh, transcription factors may legitimately bind repetitive sequence. Uh, of course there may be exceptions to this. The second piece of information is the, the genome for the background comparison so we would change this to mouse. Um, now, for this uh, tool, you don't need to know the exact version, although we, of course we know it's MM9. We just have to supply the fact that it is a, uh, a mouse genome. 
um, from this <coughs> the uh, background frequencies for all the possible um, 6, 8 and 10 uh, oligos have been created. Uh, you can decide whether or not to use both strands of the input sequence. The default is to use both strands. Uh, a single stranded analysis would be appropriate, for example, if you were expecting a purely pal palindromic motif, which reads the same on uh, both directions of the DNA. The ChipSeq heuristic here restricts the search for oligo occurrences to, uh, by default, the first 100 sequences. Uh, and this is used to, to build the, the motifs. So uh, instead of using the all of the thousands of summit regions you might input just uses the top 100. So this speeds up computational time without too much risk of losing important motifs. Uh, even if not necessary it's advisable to order the input sequences by uh, their significance so this could either be the fold enrichment value or p-value. Uh, for large data sets uh, the data should be set to a number equating to at least 10 to 20 percent of the input sequences and this is recommended by the authors. So there are some advanced options that are initially hidden but can be accessed by clicking on display. So the first one, uh, the number of discovered motifs to report limits the number of reported motifs even if they are more generated than this input value. So it, it may create maybe 50, 60 or 100 but we're only going to report the first 25. Um, the number of top scoring motifs to build occurrences um, matrix profiles and outputs for. Uh, this changes the number of top scoring motifs of length 6, 8 and 10 for which the occurrence matrix is built. Increasing this number may result in a larger number of reported motifs but with potentially more low significance and of course this will also incre increase computational time. So if increasing this value does not result in more motifs in your results it means that the additional motifs are filtered out due to the redundancy filter or that the maximum number of reported motifs uh, set by the number above has been reached. Now the default setting for the similarity threshold for redundancy filter, uh, this should be kept at the default setting 0.95 um, unless you've got a very good reason to change it. Um, the uh, review paper that I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, video uh, gives the reasons for this. And basically they've come to this um, figure by um, extensive trial and error. Okay the last the last um, input here uh, the number of expectation maximization cycles to perform the, this is the default and is, is the recommended value. So the option is included to help clean up the resulting motif matrices that are found. 
uh, in this version the number of EM steps can be increased which can be useful if you have motifs with highly redundant stretches of sequence so for example SRF the carg box transcription factor usually begins with CC has a large run of ambiguous A's or T's in the middle and then ends with GG so this could help that. There are other motifs where those intervening nucleotides could be anything at all. Uh, if you need a reminder of what the, all these options actually mean, if you look below the parameter input section you can read a summary of each of the parameters. So let's have a look at the output files themselves. Uh, the first one is the motifs output and this is the most uh, detailed of the two output files. Uh, we can have a, a look at this by clicking on the eye icon, view data, and this will appear in the middle. So at the beginning of the file there is a summary of the motifs that were discovered, ordered by their score. Uh, there's also a, a summary of the um, parameters that we use to run the analysis. Uh, the score uh, is described in more detail in the paper I mentioned at the beginning of the video but basically the score is higher when the motif has few ambiguous positions and is present in many of the input sequences. The sequence in brackets here is the reverse complement of the uh, discovered motif. Okay. Then we have uh, more detailed results for each motif. So this is motif one. This was the information that was uh, summarized above. Uh, there's also a positional weight matrix here for the motif, and below that the uh, the occurrences list, which tells you. Um, more information on each match and where they appear in the sequence. So the first field of this occurrences list contains the name of the sequence. It's truncated which is why it looks odd. Uh, this number in the second field is the position of the sequence in the input file. So this was the 133rd sequence. This was the exact match to the motif. We then have its match score, the fifth position is the uh, actual position of the uh, motif on the sequence and Lastly, we have the strand on which the motif was found. The second output file is the matrix file. Again, let's have a look at that by clicking on the I. And this file contains the PWM representation of the motifs that was present in the previous file. Now this brings me nicely on to the question of how to identify what a motif resembles or whether it is a novel discovery. Lastly I'd like to talk about identifying motifs using two tools that are available online called Stamp and TomTom. The matrix file contents from Weeder can be used as input into Stamp, which was created by the Benos Lab. 
The tool has not been updated for a long time but has a useful display showing how the different motifs are related to each other by means of hierarchical clustering. Motifs can be compared against several databases but the most useful, to me at least, are JASPAR and TRANSFAC. The TRANSFAC database is an older open access version but arguably contains more motifs than JASPAR. JASPAR is open access and has been curated, but in this case is also quite out of date. However, both in this case are good enough for a quick look to see what your motifs resemble. TomTom is part of the MEME suite of tools. It has been more recently updated and has more motif databases. It does not include TransFAC but does use a newer version of JASPAR. It also includes the PBM protein binding motif database which is particularly relevant for the analysis of the mouse genome. You can also add your own data such as if you subscribe to TransFAC. If you do the TransFAC.dat file needs to be converted to MEME format. The disadvantage is that you can only use or only compare one motif at a time from the Weeder file. So in this part I have given a brief overview of what motif discovery entails. Weeder is a great first port of call and is easily implemented in Galaxy. Once you have a set of discovered motifs, you can look to see whether they resemble anything in the databases of known transcription factors, if that's applicable to you. Well, thanks for watching. Goodbye.